Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always. Um, as m- the, my fellow listeners will know and my viewers will know, on October 18th, we are heading to the polls in the city of Calgary, and that is to elect municipal councillors, mayor. But there are also other elections happening on that day as well. One being Senate, one being school board trustees, The other is the reason why we have our guest today on the show, and that is the issue around fluoride in Calgary's water. We today we have, and I want to get this correct here, the campaign manager for Fluoride Yes, Professor Juliet Guichon on the show to talk about the campaign, why it's important to have fluoride in water, and where we move forward from here. Professor Juliet, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, So as a relatively new transplant to the city of Calgary, uh, I I was under the suspicion that we already had fluoride in our water because I come from a municipality that had it, but we don't. And I want to know for a bit of a backstory because I want to make sure all my listeners know because when I brought this subject up in a debate on... uh, uh, in in early in early about a week ago, people were surprised that this issue was on the ballot in October 18th. So how did we get here? Why is fluoride on the ballot on October 18th? Well, the story starts in 1989 when Calgarians favored fluoridation in a plebiscite, and then in 1998, Calgarians were again asked whether they wished fluoridation. Uh, to to be a public health program in Calgary. And they again said yes. So we had two plebiscites in favor of fluoridation. Then in 2011, city councillors, 10 of them, voted to cease the fluoridation program. They did not return to the people to ask whether their opinion had changed. They acted, so they acted against the will of the people. They acted against medical advice and they had no electoral mandate. They had just uh, run for city council in the October 2010 election and fluoridation was not an issue. It was never mentioned in that campaign. So the 10 city councils had no, uh, they had no basis in democracy to undermine the will of the people as they did and to undermine public health as they have done and as has been proven that they have done. So, Then in 2017, um, I was asked by a dentist who specializes in working with children to to form a campaign to help the dentists on the front line who are seeing deteriorating health, the oral health in children, to do something about this. So I created a group called Calgarians for Kids Health, and we made fluoridation an election issue in the 2017 municipal campaign. And we kept going. We engaged in a number of uh, strategic initiatives which were designed to amplify the voice of public health and to engage with the city councillors, who were then city councillors, uh, persistently in the public media and in one-on-one meetings to help them, encourage them to reinstate the fluoridation program which Calgarians had voted for twice but we couldn't move them to reinstate. On February 1st, 2021, there was a vote to reinstate or not. And we, the people of Calgary, lost that vote 6-8. But then then there was a second important vote minutes later, and that, that was to push the matter to a plebiscite, to put it back to a plebiscite um, again. And that, in effect, we, we won that vote 10-4. So that is why we, um, Calgarians for Kids Health, instead of having to convince eight people uh, that they should reinstate the program that we already voted for, we have to convince 380,000 people um, again to vote in favor. And that that amount, 380,000, is about 65% of the number of people who voted in the last election. So we would like to have a resounding yes vote so that this never happens again, that elected officials never again undermine the will of the people and um, act against medical advice to harm public health in Calgary. 
Now, I, I just want to follow up on a, a statement that you just said there about 380,000. Uh, is that a requirement for the plebiscite vote? Not at all. No, it's 50% plus one. We'll do okay. it. But we, we're aiming higher. We'd like, we'd like to have um, Calgarians make it absolutely clear that they're, they're not appreciative of this behavior of former city councillors. Although some so are running again. <laughs> they are. And uh, for those who are listening, uh, the link to the fluorideyes.ca campaign website is in the show notes, where you can actually go in and see where candidates who have responded to a survey from the campaign, the Yes Fluoride campaign, where your candidates in your ward and the mayor stand on this issue. I want to talk, though, about why it's important why it's important to have fluoride in the water, because um, I think there is some misinformation out there. And I think there is some miss, uh, there's always misinformation out there because we are in 2021 with social media and everyone has their own opinion on everything. But I wanna get the actual information from you, the campaign manager of uh, Fluoride Yes. Why is it important in today's day to have fluoride in our water? Well, thank you for asking. So first of all, we have fluoride in our water. It comes in, it leaches from the rocks in the Rocky Mountains, and it comes, it flows through the foothills into our reservoirs, the Bears Park and the Glenmore uh, water treatment plants. Um, and it, the amount varies depending upon the season. During the spring runoff, there's more pressure on the rocks, so we have slightly more fluoride naturally coming in with other minerals such as calcium. So the, the naturally occurring level is is less than one part per million. It's 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 parts per million, again, depending on the season. And what a fluoridation program would do, would constantly measure the amount of fluoride naturally coming in from the Rockies and adjust it very slightly. It would be adjusted to be still less than one part in a million parts, less than one in a million, it would be 0 0.7. It, the, the amount of fluoride in the water would be a constant level of 0 0.7. So we're talking about a minuscule amount of fluoride. And yet this minuscule amount um, enervates a whole group of people who state falsehoods about that minuscule amount of fluoride in the water's effects on the human body. Um, and, and you know, it, this has been going on for decades because there are some people who are conspiracy theorists, thinkers, and they get very upset about um, public health programs and about um, adjusting existing minerals in the water because it's the drinking water and they uh, are untrustful of government. By nature, that's how they are. Um, but the, their claims have always been investigated. They've al always been taken seriously and they've been reviewed by people who are the public health officials. So just so um, the viewers know, to become a public health officer, such as Dr. Dina Hinshaw, uh, one has to earn a medical degree. And then having become a doctor, one undergoes five years of specialty training. And in, that, in those five years, people are trained to read and understand statistical methods so that they can review studies to determine whether they're strong, in other words, reliable, or weak, in other words, unreliable. And so the studies that the um, fluoridation opponents use are weak studies. They're weak for a variety of reasons. For example, they don't use strong methods, or they, they're conducted in places like China and India, where there's such a large amounts of fluoride in the water that they produce severe effects on humans. And, and those levels would be, up, for example, 16 parts per million. And that is too much, that is too much. And it's not fluoride's fault that there are certain areas where there's too much in the water. It's just the way it is. Um, but you, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't drink seawater, but yet everybody needs a little bit of salt. You need a little bit of salt, but too much is bad. We know that. Um, likewise, this minuscule amount of fluoride in the water is safe and all claims that it is unsafe have been investigated and they have not been found to be reliable. Um, and so I'd like to turn just briefly to the claim that fluoride harms the developing brain. So that 
That claim has been advanced in the most prestigious publication to date by Florida opponents. They managed to uh, publish that in a journal called uh, JAMA Pediatrics, the Journal of American Medical Association Pediatrics. And that was published in October, in August 2019. And I, I should qualify that. I don't need to say that the authors are fluoridation points. Um, they are researchers in a variety of institutions. The problem with that study, there were, there were a number, but the, the main one that I can explain here is they published subgroup analysis rather than the main effect. They dwelled on a subgroup and not on the main effect. So what they set out to study was whether uh, fetuses, when they're in their mother's body, when exposed to fluoride, have a lower IQ. And they measured, they had 400 mother-child pairs, and some were in fluoridated areas and some were not. And then they did an IQ test at three. So th the problem is that they didn't report the effect. So the, the alleged effect on, of fluoride on IQ in the group was, and these are the numbers, the uh, average IQ is 108.21 in the, the fluoridated group and 108.07 in the unfluoridated group. So there's a 0.14 difference. In other words, they did not find a difference. That's not enough of a difference in IQ to show that there's any effect of fluoride on IQ. But what they then did was they looked at the analysis differently and they, they purport to find an effect in, on one part of a two-part test in boys only. So the equivalent of that would be like um, trying to investigate whether people like the stampede. So they have a survey of 10 days of, of people leaving, exiting the grounds and asking them, how would you rate your stampede experience? And they get the data and they find that most people, 85% like the stampede. So, you know, they're minded, these researchers are minded to publish something else. So they look at the data on the Tuesday and Wednesday when it was cold and rainy, and they published that data, which showed that 49% uh, like the stampede. So they published the cold and rainy data as though that were the overall data. So that cold and rainy data is subgroup. That's a subgroup analysis. The main effect would be a report on the 10 days. So this group of researchers in their abstract and in the narrative of their report, they report the subgroup analysis. That's the equivalent of cold and rainy day analysis as, a, as opposed to the main effect. The main effect they bury in table, in one line of table two in their report. So it isn't the case that a study reported in JAMA Pediatrics has found that there's harm to the brain. There's, a, there, there's another big problem with that study. That study did not cite two much larger and much better designed uh, studies that looked at this very question, whether fluoridation causes harm to the brain. There was one study conducted and reported in, in New Zealand in 2015 that looked at more than a thousand people. Remember the pediatric study was 400. This was more than a thousand. And it followed them over 38 years when multiple IQ tests were conducted over those years. And they found that there's no effect. So this is a much better study because it, it looks at it over a number of years. You know, you can imagine corralling three-year-olds to get them to sit down, especially three-year-old boys, to sit down and do an IQ test. Whereas this study looked at them when they were increasingly capable, capable of sitting for the, uh, the test. So it's a much better designed study, and yet the researchers did not cite it in their literature review, which is odd. The second big report was hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and this report was a Swedish report of the Swedish population. And there they have naturally fluoridated levels of water at the fluoridation level. So 0 .0 0.7 to 1.5 uh, parts per million. And, and then areas that didn't have that benefit. And they, they looked and they found that people in the fluoridated areas, not just had, they didn't have any effect on their IQ. There was no evidence of effect on, on their IQ of fluoride, of fluoride in the water. But secondly, they had higher income and they attribute that to um, less pain and developmental delay waiting for dental treatment and a, a better cosmetic appearance so that they were better candidates for jobs. And that study of more than but hundreds of thousands of Swedish people was again not cited 
in that study, even though the working or pardon me, the working report was available in 2017, two years prior to the 2019 general pediatrics report. I've tried to do my research on this subject before talking to you because uh, part of my job is to play devil's advocate because I, mm. I, I need because at the end of the day there are people out there and we I, I literally spoke to one last night who said that it's been ten years and we have had our water has not had fluor, fluor, fluoride fluoridation in it. Everyone seems to be okay. Why would we put something into our water supply that we don't know what the outcomes are going to be? You can list off the, and I'm yet again, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I, 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 I support fluoridation in our water system. I will be upfront with that right now. But I want to know the, 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 the rebuttal to, we don't know how much fluoride is going to go into a person of 100 pounds compared to 250 pounds because the 100 pound athlete is going to drink more water, is going to drink more water, meaning they're going to have more fluoride. So there's going to be potential of having harm done to them compared to someone who's 250 pounds who's going to drink even more water and they're going to have something happen to them. What is the rebuttal to that statement? Because I'm looking at it and saying, okay, it's not going to harm you, but I'm not a medical professional professional at this, and I'm not the campaign manager for the Yes Fluoride campaign. So to those people who say you don't know how much is going to go in your system, and it's been 10 years, and no one's had a, a negative effect because of no, not having fluoride in our water, where do you stand on that? Okay, so there, there's two questions. The first is um, the allegation, the false claim that the absence of fluoridation has not harmed public health. Th that's not true. And then the second claim is that um, there's a problem of, of intake based on weight. So with respect to the first claim, there is both um, seriously and prud prudentially conducted research that demonstrates unequivocally that there has been a significant increase in dental decay in grade two children. And the reason that that group is researched is because they have both uh, primary teeth, baby teeth, and secondary teeth, permanent teeth in their mouth. And so it's a good uh, age group to study. And uh, Dr. Lindsay McLaren and her colleagues studied that age group by looking at looking for decayed tooth surfaces in the 2013-14 school year, and then again in the 2018-19 school year. And they found a significant increase between um, the data that they had prior, and then the 2013-14 point in time, and then a change in the curve, so that the, the curve of decay was, was like that, but then the slope changed between 2013-14 and 2018-19. And, and perhaps the reason for the change in the slope, uh, a dramatic increase in decay, was that the 2018-19 children had never had the benefit of the fluoridation program, whereas the 13-14 group had had some benefit because in their early years, in about, they were probably born in about 2008-2009, they had some benefit. So, so that's probably why they increased. That, um, Dr. McLaren and her colleagues compared the Calgary outcome to, to matched classrooms of grade two children in Edmonton, they were matched for socioeconomic status. So that she did the best she could in making sure that the samples were the same in terms of, of relevant criteria. And those, the Edmonton children's dental decay went up in 2013-14 and then it went down in 2018. So the gap between the Edmonton, the Calgary children in terms of dental decay and the Edmonton children is significant. It is a significant difference. And um, in addition to looking at tooth surfaces, they, um, they took nail clippings of some of the children to, be sh to measure how much fluoride they had in their bodies to be sure that they were, that it was fluoride that was the difference. They compared the nail clippings between the Calgary children and the, the Edmonton children, a subgroup of both groups. And then the third thing they did was they asked the parents in both Calgary and Edmonton to tell them about two things, the preventive steps they're taking and their socioeconomic status. And the preventive steps they asked them about was brushing and flossing, diet, fluoride rinses, visits to the dentist, fluoride applications at the dentist. And then the socioeconomic steps, their questions were about 
uh, level of education attained last level and uh, whether they own their own home, whether outright or with a mortgage. So on all measures of prevention steps, the Calgary parents were doing more. They were doing more to prevent dental decay and yet they had worse outcomes than the Edmonton parents had. And secondly, with respect to socioeconomic status, the Calgary parents were in a higher socioeconomic back bracket than the Edmonton parents. So this suggests two things. One, fluoridation is necessary. You can't just brush and floss, as everybody says. Just brush and floss, just brush and floss. Teach your kids not to eat so much sugar. You know, there, there are these tropes that people use, but the evidence suggests that even if you do that, you still don't get the outcomes that you would hope for. And secondly, others say, rather dismissively in my opinion, of the challenges that people face who have low socioeconomic status, um, they say, oh, it's just for poor kids. It doesn't affect my kids or it doesn't affect people I care about. But that's not the case. The evidence shows that's not the case. It affects all children. So those, those, that's the peer-reviewed literature that has shown us in Calgary what's happened since we've lost fluoridation in a detailed, rigorous manner. So before you jump, before you jump onto the, your next statement here, uh, you, you have just brought up something that I have heard a few times on social media, and yet again, uh, I, I try to not listen to the social media chatter because sometimes it's false. Surprise, surprise. One one of the things that I've heard, and people seem to come at me when, or they 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 tweet at me, or they send me Facebook messages when I post something about fluoride is. All fluoride does is allows kids to eat more candy so dentists can get more money when they have to fix their teeth. How do you come, how do you say that, that you, you just talked about more sugar income for low, lower social economic uh, classes? You talked about the sugar intake. How do you say to people, this is not a we want fluoride so people can eat more sugar? It's the right medical, healthy thing to do for our teeth. Well, so when fluoride is, in, is adjusted in the water to 0 0.7 parts per million, children have, the, have access to the right amount of fluoride to build their teeth so that they're strong. So you, everybody remembers that, maybe, maybe most people remember the story of the three little pigs, you know, building a house of straw, a house of wood, or a house of bricks. So fluoride helps children build teeth that are made of bricks, the equivalent of bricks so that they're resistant to decay, no matter whether they have access to lots of fruits and vegetables or whether their parents can't afford that and they have access to other foods that are high in carbohydrates. Um, so the, the, it's important for people to understand that, that the, the right amount of fluoride is necessary for building the teeth. And then the right amount of fluoride in the water helps us um, resist dental decay 24 seven, because when it's ingested, it's incorporated in the saliva and the saliva bathes the teeth all day long. But nobody in, in the, you know, every medical, dental, public health organization supports water fluoridation, but none of them say that it will do everything to protect oral health. All those organizations recommend fluoridation, brushing and flossing, uh, attention to diet and regular visits to the dentist. That's, you, you need to engage in all four activities to have great oral health. But th this is one measure that people can access just by drinking the water. And so it doesn't require parents who are overburdened, um, who don't have any money to go to the dentist or to buy a diet that they can't afford to feed their children or to supervise their children's uh, access to candy when they're doing two shifts of minimum wage labor. And, and, and that's, that's people of low so socioeconomic status. The evidence has already shown that people of high socioeconomic status have kids with dental decay because this measure was lost. So, um, you know, that would be kind of like saying that claim that it just, fluoridation, it just allows children to have more sugar so the dentist can make more money is, um, is misguided. I mean, the premise is false, but it would almost be like saying all seatbelts do is allow people to drink and trauma surgeons to make money. I mean, who would say that? It's a preventive measure. It's a preventive measure that we can all take that is really inexpensive. It's about $1.20 per person per year on the assumption that we have 1.36 million people in Calgary and a $30 million 
uh, cost over 20 years of the project. You do the math and it comes out to about $1.20 per person per year. So why not spend that money to help all children in Calgary have a good start in life and all the rest of us, no matter whether we had the benefit of fluoridation as children or not, to have lower dental decay. It's not as though people are gonna run out and eat a bag of sugar once the fluoridation program is established, re-established. Uh, so I wanna get, uh I want to get back to the, question. yeah, the second question about fluoride and water. For oh, dosing. The thing about dosing. So, so yes. that, that's just, um, it, it's, it's not a good claim. Fluoridation is safe at 4.0 parts per million and below. Although at 4.0 parts per million, there's, there's more increase of um, changes in the tooth surface because it's a very high amount. Um, but it might comfort your listeners and viewers to know that the amount in Australia is 1.0 parts per million. And that's the fluoridation amount in Australia. Australia tends to be hotter, so people tend to drink more water because they, they perspire more. And the, you know, that's the amount they use there, and there's no problem. So the claim about weight is, um, I think, an ir irrational, an, an attempt at a rational explanation for an irrational fear about water fluoridation. You, you mentioned Edmonton a while back, and I want to I want to get on the record here that this is not a new thing that the city of Calgary is going to be putting in. Other cities and municipalities across Alberta, even around Canada, have fluoride and fluoridated, fluoridated water, correct? Fluoridation is the norm in great cities. Almost 90% of National Hockey League cities are fluoridated. The, the only four... Um, teams that aren't fluoridated are the Canucks in Vancouver, the Mont Montreal in Calgary, and uh, the team in New Jersey. That's it. All the great cities of the United States are fluoridated. And in Canada, Red Deer, Edmonton are fluoridated. Um, Winnipeg, Ottawa, Toronto, Hamilton, Halifax. Those are just a few. It's, it's the norm of great cities. It's, it's, we had it. A generation of Calgarians have grown up with fluoridation. And some of the members of that generation are calling on their own age group to pay it forward. They recognize the benefit they've had. And they're saying to the, their group, their age group, which is about age 20 to 35 or 40, they're saying, we know that fluoridation is beneficial. We know we have great oral health. We have to show up at the ballot box and pay it forward to these little kids who are having terrible trouble. So returning to the, the claim, the false claim that there's been no change, I gave you the peer-reviewed research, which is specific to Calgary, but there's lots of anecdotal evidence from dentists and physicians in the emergency department of a rapidly deteriorating state of oral health in Calgary. So in, in the dental chair, I mean, they see it. They see bigger holes sooner in life than they used to see. Um, and there's more work. And many people have lost their dental coverage with the loss of their salary positions in the oil industry. And so they have less ability to pay. Um, but also physicians are seeing dental decay in the emergency department much more than they used to. People are showing up, they have terrible pain, they don't know what it's caused by. It might be in their head. Like, like, I don't mean that they're making it up. I mean that they have a headache. And um, that, that can mean that they have a, a decayed upper tooth and the root goes up quite high and then the infection can spread to the brain, which is very serious. Or if it's in the lower jaw, it can spread to the throat and close the throat. Um, so it can be life-threatening. And the, the um, infectious disease specialist, Dr. Cora Constanescu, reported to city council that the, the number of children needing emergency intravenous antibiotic therapy to save their lives has increased 700% since 2011 because of uh, an infection that originated in, in the mouth because of poor oral health. So there's lots of evidence of a change and no evidence, by the way, of, of a reduction in, in all the things that they say fluoridation causes. And they cite um, attention deficit disorder, infertility, cancers of all sorts, uh, poor IQ. They, there's a, a panoply of harms that they seize upon, but you know, people make stuff up. And if people want reliable information, then they should turn to the Alberta Health Services website and the Canadian Public, Agent, Canadian Public Health Agency site or the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. 
Those are just three sites with very reliable information. So I, I got to I gotta piggyback on that question, that statement there, because for those who are listening to this right now, they are listening to myself, a former journalist, a uh, someone who has no medical degree when it comes to fluoride, who has no medical degree at all, who trusts the doctors with what they say. But who is Yes Fluoride? Who is fluoride? Yes, I apologize. Who are you? Who 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 is your board? Who who makes up this organization? Because you can spew what you you can in the forty five minutes that we have together, but at the end of the day, the person's going to walk away and say, "She's just another person who's telling me what I should be thinking." And I'm I'm going to go think for myself. So, who are the people of fluoride? Yes. Okay. So I'm a um, born and bred Calgarian. I, I was born at the Holy Cross Hospital, as was my mother. Um, and my, my grandfather was a city councillor in 1924 to probably about 29, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I have a PhD in law, I studied at Yale and Oxford for, for three degrees, and then I earned my doctorate in law at the University of Toronto. I'm employed by the University of Calgary in the Faculty of Medicine. And because I'm trained in law, I, I try to help um, give voice to public health because public health has such great ability to improve all of our lives. And I want Calgarians to benefit as much as we can from, from the science that underpins the public health recommendations. I'm just one person. Other people in um, fluoride, yes, are the dentist I told you about who works with children and sees this dramatically deteriorating public uh, decline in uh, oral health. A pediatrician, an MD, PhD, in somebody who has a doctoral degree and an undergraduate medical degree in medicine, and he specializes in family medicine, but helps devise screening mechanisms in preventive health. He's a preventive health specialist. Um, we have uh, at least at, at least two other people trained in law who are practicing law. Um, we have a business person. Uh, somebody trained in finance who keeps our books, for which we're very grateful, uh, people who are knowledgeable in politics and help us uh, reach out to the city councilors who we met. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting you, 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 like, And the list is on the website of yes, floridayes.ca. Right. Again, to my listeners and to my viewers, please check that website out because it's greatly, it's a great resource and it's a great way to find out where your candidates stand in this upcoming election, but also gives you ways to reach out to people who can ask, you can ask these questions. Um, and also, and I want to, I want to put this on the record on the website, you, 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 you have released who is backing your organization. You have released the donors to your organization. Um, I appreciate that because you you are being transparent with the people who are backing fluoride. Yes, so thank you so much for that. Yes, and our um, so most we have a disproportionate number of physicians and dentists who support us. And to those who say dentists profit from fluoridation, actually the opposite is the truth. If we get good oral health, then they have less holes to fill. So dentists who contribute to us are acting in the public interest. They don't like to see people in pain. Um, so it, it's important to note that the group who oppose fluoridation in Calgary are sourcing their funding from the United States from an organization that's funded in part by one of the, the number one uh, disinformation dozen as cited by the Center for Hate, which is an organization based in Washington and London, England. And that organization said that about 60% of uh, vaccination disinformation comes from 10, 12 people. And Joseph Mercola is the number one person they named. And Joseph Mercola is funding um, the organization in the States that's trying to end water fluoridation. And that is um, trying to raise money for fluoridation opposition in Calgary. And Joseph Mercola, by, he scares people about fluoridation, about COVID vaccines. And then he sells an you know, alternative you know, medicine or yes, therapeutics. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. And he's made a lot of money, um, an, an awful lot of money by scaring people about public health. So we, we have complained about foreign funds being used 
in our election. Um, and we haven't received any um, fulsome response about that. If, if a candidate were sourcing funds beyond the province of Alberta, then they would be stopped. But because it's an issue, we're waiting to hear whether that funding source will be stopped. But I, I do resent, as a Calgarian, I do resent foreign funds being used in our city to undermine our children's public, uh, oral health. I think that's despicable. And I think Calgarians should rise up and say, no, we are going to defend our children's access to preventive health care. One of the biggest things I need to address here is people are unaware that this issue is on the ballot box on October 18th. You can do interviews like this, but I am a small organization and we have a reach of a certain amount of people. Um, how are we getting the message out? How are people learning about this? Because I can do my best to get the message out, but there has to be other methods that you're using. So how are you connecting with people and ensuring that they are aware that on October 18th, the fluoridation is on the ballot and they need to make the choice for our kids and ourselves around uh, good dental health. So we're using social media, um, signs on lawns and in windows, um, banners over roadways. All of this can be done only with donations. So um, the more money we have, the more work we can do in that regard. And um, I've written to Elections Calgary to say it's not fair that you announce in the newspaper that there's an election for mayor, city council, school board trustee, um, but you don't mention that there's a plebiscite. And you know, I've asked them the next time you run an ad, which all taxpayers are paying for, could you please mention that there's a plebiscite about fluoridation? And I don't know what the outcome of that request will be. Um, beyond what we're doing, perhaps your listeners could also tell everybody you know, just get the word out through their own social media friends and uh, contacts and their friends and family so that they understand that the question is on the ballot and it asks, um, it asks the question in such a way that we hope they'll answer yes. And that's why our name is Fluoride Yes. Um, it's do you, something like, do you favor the reinstatement of the fluoridation, the water fluoridation program? And we hope you'll say yes, just to yes. And then uh, we'll get out of this soup that we're in in terms of oral, oral health um, and we'll help everybody. So uh, anyone who's anyone will know that a plebiscite is just that, a vote. This is not a binding issue. At the end of the day, councillors who are elected do not have to follow through on this vote. They should because that's the will of the people, but it is not a binding vote of the people. How are you connecting with the people who are running and how are you ensuring that this actually does happen if you get that 380,000 people or that 50% plus one vote on October 18th? Well, first of all, we've asked all the candidates to tell us whether they will support um, a positive plebiscite vote. And most say yes. Even, even if they oppose fluoridation, most of them say, um, notwithstanding my private views, I will follow the will of the people. So we will hold them to that uh, once the election has taken place. We have to be mindful when they first take their seats, there's going to be a big turnover in, the, in who sits around that council chamber's uh, table. And I think it's at least nine nine seats will change. So we have to give them a chance to catch their breath from the rigors of the election campaign, get familiar with the job. And then we're going to hold them to account because this, there should be no delay beyond what's necessary for them to understand their new walk, the role that they've taken on. Uh, but there should be no delay in, in granting the, and the water engineering department permission to go, to go ahead and purchase this equipment because they have to, they have to order it, they have to install it. And then once they start uh, bumping up a little bit the, the amount of fluoride in the water, it will take a while for us to see the effects in our oral health. So the sooner the better. So 
So on the one hand, we want to be respectful of these people in their new world, but on the other, we're impatient. We've, we've waited a decade for uh, the will of the people to be recognized and um, given back to. So we will be respectful, but we'll stay on. We are at the 40 minute mark. And I want to, I, I'm going to turn over the show to you for however long you want to address the people who are listening and the people who are watching this. Why is it important? And I'm going to ask you this question to address to the people and hopefully take as long as you need if you want to. Why is it important for the people of Calgary to vote yes on this fluoride fluoridation on October 18th? It's important for yourself. For yourself as a resident of Calgary, your oral health will improve. It's important for the seniors whom you love because their oral health will improve as they lose the ability to be rigorous in their oral hygiene. It's important for children who need it to form their teeth uh, so that they'll be resistant to decay throughout their life and to protect them from their own habits of, of loving sugar. It's important to disabled people who, some of whom are develop, developmentally delayed and will never brush and floss. It's important to new Canadians who might've had high naturally occurring fluoride levels in their water back home and they don't know that they have to be rigorous in brushing and flossing in Calgary. And it's important to Indigenous uh, Canadians, some of whom live, who will access, uh, they access our water treatment um, on the Tsutsina Reserve. And they too will benefit and their children and their seniors will benefit. All of us will benefit. None of us will be harmed. If there's any harm at all, it's minor, it's a cosmetic harm, and it comes from primarily sucking on the toothpaste tube. So just don't, don't ingest toothpaste, don't let your kids suck on the toothpaste tube. But uh, water fluoridation will benefit everybody. It will harm nobody. And it is what the people want and it is what public health authorities recommend. And so you have a great opportunity. You have a great opportunity to improve everybody's life, including your own. So um, vote yes, please. <laughs> vote yes. <laughs> I will push this out as much as I possibly can because I believe I, I'm shocked that we don't have it. And uh, it is an important uh, tool in our health that we should be using. Um, Professor Juliet Gishon, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been uh, enlightening and I, I'm glad I can use my platform to get this message out because like I said, it is important. Um, for my listeners and to my viewers, I, I say this over and over again, but I'm going to keep on saying it until October 18th, vote. Get out and vote on this issue. This is an important issue for our, our health, and you need to get out and vote. But also, if you have a question that you have for the Fluoride Yes campaign, the links to their website, their Facebook page, their Twitter, and their Instagram are in the show notes please reach out so you can get the correct information. Uh, Professor Gishon, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation.